Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. A question for you to open up our podcast this week. Ever want to find even greater joy in the ordinary moments, ordinary experiences, and ordinary conversations within your life? Well, if so, and I hope your answer is yes, today's guest is expert at not only modeling that through her life, but also helping us experience more fully the gifts within our lives. Kelly Corrigan is a celebrated storyteller, and she's a four-time New York Times bestselling author. As the host of PBS Tell Me More with Kelly Corrigan, Kelly shares insightful conversations with thought leaders like Angela Duckworth, James Corden, and Jennifer Garner, along with many, many, many others. Great conversations. She pulls out poignant lessons that we can use in order to better understand our calling, to better understand ourselves. Today, Kelly's going to join us to share her heartfelt wisdom and profound lessons that she's learned along the way around love and parenting and growing up and self-discovery and the importance of joy and laughter, even in the face of uncertainty and struggle. This was a fun conversation. It was emotional. It is practical. It is for you. So my friends, if you want to feel inspired to think more, feel more, do more, and be better, then buckle up right now. Grab your favorite Live Inspired journal and pen. You'll need both because today's conversation with Kelly Corrigan is going to be purposeful in your journey. So without further ado, let me bring her onto the stage. Kelly Corrigan, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Hey, how are you, John O'Leary? I'm better now that Kelly Corrigan is on the, the call with me. And uh, I, I know, like, sometimes I'm like, man, I hope this will be a good conversation, either for me selfishly or for our listeners. I know today is going to be awesome for all of us. So I'm excited about this one for my friends listening in right now or watching us right now who have not yet heard about you, read about you, watched you somehow on television or other places. And if you had to introduce yourself to them, how would you do that? Mm -hmm. I'm a mom. I have two kids. They're 20 and 22. I grew up outside of Philadelphia. I have two older brothers who were very sporty and I was very arty farty. And when I was 36 with two kids in diapers, I found a lump in my breast and a week later I was in chemotherapy and I did cancer treatment for about two years, some surgeries, a lot of chemicals, a lot of success. And coming out of that, right at the same time, my father, who was the dearest person on earth to me, was also diagnosed with cancer. And that begat a book, which is called The Middle Place. And that began what has been sort of a public life for me, where I have a podcast, Kelly Corrigan Wonders. I have a TV show on PBS called Tell Me More. And then I have uh, five books that I've written and I'm working on another. And if I ever finish it, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> uh, and in my free time, I, I shower once a month, apparently. So uh, yeah. you, you have a, a lot going on, a wild, painful, beautiful, and I think redemptive life story. We're going to unpack it during this time together. And I'm excited about it. We're going we're gonna to back the train up from the West Coast where you do a lot of that work and a lot of that writing all the way back to Philly, man, the city yeah. of brotherly love. You talked about your brothers. You whispered about your mom and dad. I want you to spend a little bit more time roaring. Uh, I only know your dad through what you've written about him, but I love him. Yeah. You know, like he just seems you like would, the kind of guy. Would, I would, he would. He would do backflips for you. I love him, man. So uh, I want our listeners to love him too. Talk about your dad for a moment. So he's one of six kids out of Baltimore. They had, they had one bathroom, four boys grew up in the same room. And there was a lot of love and a lot of energy and a lot of personality in that house. They all went to college um, on the GI Bill. They, he played lacrosse in college and was an All-American. He sold ad space for women's magazines which is sort of hilarious. So like Stain Master Carpet was a big account, Revlon and Benson and Hedges. And he was what he called a road warrior. So he was driving up and down 95, trying to rally people for a full page ad across from the table of contents. 
in McCall's and then Good Housekeeping. He's an on again, off again coach. He coached everything my brothers played, ice hockey, lacrosse. And then the last 10 years of his life, he was the assistant coach to a guy who was, you know, 35 years younger than he was. Mm. And when he died, uh, I mean, I'm going to say 150 lacrosse players came. And my oh, mother, gosh. in a move that was so creative and like a little secret joy for her, in the back of the church, put these two huge boxes of Radnor lacrosse jerseys. And so if you had ever played for him, you put a jersey over your suit. And then when my brother, GT, who's also a big lacrosse person, Hall of Fame, played in college, coached a lot, when he got up to make his remarks, we all three of us spoke, he said, if you have played lacrosse for my dad, please come sit behind me. And they had these beautiful, like rounded, it's almost like where a choir would sit. And so all of a sudden, like from this huge church at Villanova University, this beautiful chapel, and we think there were like 700 people there because we ran out of the little programs and we had printed 600. These all over the church, these players came and sat behind my brother GT while he spoke and while the rest of us eulogized my dad. Mm. So he was a person that you'd never forget meeting. You'd think he was laser focused on you. He loved a story. He was just genuinely interested in, in who you were and what you had to teach him. It was a very natural gift that he came into the world with. I don't think that he achieved it. I don't think he read it in a book and tried right. to put on the clothes of somebody who was deeply other focused. I think it just was his nature. And he was so special to me because I was the only girl in this family. I had these two older brothers. They were such a natural fit for my dad. Like those guys played so many games together. Any game you could play, ping pong, darts, pick up basketball, et cetera, pool. Um, and then he, it was effortless for him to be equally thrilled by me and my funny collages or like the little bench I tried to make or a drawstring bag I sewed with my mom's sewing machine or a little bit of needlepoint that I was experimenting with. Like he just, he thought I was so great. Man, it's so good to have someone in our lives look at us and know that they're thinking we are so great. <laughs> it is. And we call it the face of love, my husband and I. And when we're, we've been raising these girls all these years, and sometimes we get too tight or we get worried, and our face might be sort of projecting anxiety or concern or frustration or disappointment. And then one of us will say to the other, face of love, face of love. And then you just turn it on. You like bring, we used to call my dad Greenie. So you just bring Greenie through and give that to them. Because of all the people in the world, you got to have somebody yeah. who is like 100% face of love. I know you spoke and you've shared a little bit of your eulogy, but our audience may not know it. Is, is there anything specifically from those remarks at Villanova's chapel today that you want our audience to know that you said about your dad in front of 700 others? Oh, you're going to make me cry. Uh, the thing... The thing that he built in me and reinforced in me and was uh, it's equally daring to love as it is to be loved, to let yourself be loved as you are, instead of putting on a big front and persuading someone to love you, but just to like let it hang out a little bit and let them see the whole of you and not um, mince words and not project confidence when you don't have it. And so I, the thing I said at the very end is like, I, I think I'll be okay because I know how to love people and I know how to let them love me back. Man, I mean, so behind you are 150 red jerseys in front of you are about 500 friends and right in front of you is a woman wearing black. I'm imagining named mom. Yeah. Yeah. So, you listen, your dad's your hero, but mom is right with them. So brag on your mom for a moment, this beautiful lady. So one of the books I wrote is called Glitter and Glue, and it's this great line of my mom's, which is your father's the glitter, but I'm the glue. It takes both, Kelly. 
And <laughs> I, and that's a thing that you really come to appreciate over time. Like it's it's fun to be with the guy who's gung ho, like the camp counselor guy, but it's essential that behind the camp counselor is the accountant and the facilities operator and basically like the COO, yes. or the CFO of our family. And and it takes years and a little experience with parenting to appreciate that she she created the conditions in which my dad and I could just sort of link arms and skip around together because everything that was hard was taken care of by her and it, they didn't have it wasn't like they had gobs of money or whatever but she made whatever they had work um we all went to college without debt so she's that person she's the person who's like give me your paycheck i'm going to figure this out um but she's also she's fa even more fascinating to me now because she's a widow and i'm watching her and realizing how deeply confident she is and how content so i think she had like a 54 years or something crazy with my dad and but she's really a model of um, self-care, mm. not in a bubble bath and champagne kind of self-care way, but like she goes to church every day and she plays bridge two times a week and she has made new friends in her widowhood and she reads a lot of library books and she's just set up her widowhood in a way that's really satisfying and and complete for her and i feel myself like squirreling notes away like this is how you do it this is how you grow old gracefully and you know she's lucky she doesn't have so many of the problems that people in their 80s have she doesn't have them so she can do those things she can still drive a car she can still play bridge which is very complex she still goes up and down her stairs like she lives in the house i grew up in so when I go home, I sleep in my bedroom. And I think people, so many people are like, God, your mom still lives in that house. Like, what about the stairs? And I think the stairs are saving her. And I think the house is saving her because I think having to manage the roof and the storm windows and the leak in the basement is part of what gives her purpose and part of what gives her a sense of pride. Like she is managing expertly. And I think that probably makes her walk tall it should i mean i would if, if i were her i'd be really proud of myself shoulders back so you know listen our listeners are already picking up that you speak like i wish i wrote <laughs> <laughs> so like <laughs> with with a document in front of me given enough time and maybe a couple cups of coffee and then a glass of wine i could write at least as well as you just shared that story <laughs> but it would take me a couple hours and a little bit of drinks uh, when did you recognize <laughs> that not only were your mom and dad remarkable, but you had a, a gift of being able to express yourself beautifully? Well, what I realized is that I liked English class more than the other classes. And I liked talking in English class. I was really active participant in all those conversations. And I, ha I went to Radnor High School outside of Philadelphia. It's a public school. And sophomore, junior, and senior year, I had PhDs like Dr. Dusnap, Dr. Hemminger in a public high school. So I was in tiny English classes of 10, 15 kids who everyone did the reading. And that's just very, I think that's very unusual for high school. Yeah. And people were engaging meaningfully with the texts. And so I knew I loved that. And I knew I was impressed by that. Then the other piece of it, that really affects how I write is that my dad's family are storytellers and joke tellers. And at Christmas, we would all jam into my Aunt Mary's house in Baltimore, one bathroom in the whole house. And there'd be 35 Corrigans in there drinking beer and standing in line. We would have a line and then the boys would go outside. Like it was that bad. So anyway, at some point every time an aunt or an uncle would stand on the coffee table and tell a long joke. Not a quick joke, but one of those story jokes with accents and each character is named and they have backstories and whatever. So it was really like painting a picture. 
And we would laugh so hard. And I remember thinking, I personally think that is cooler than being able to put a ball in a net. I think that of all the things I've seen people do in my young life, doing that is the coolest. Mm -hmm. And so somehow that like Irish storytelling energy and then everything I was actually learning in these English classes. And then I went on to be an English major and then I went on to get a master's in English literature. The, the more serious study of like what makes a great story, what makes a great character, what makes a great sentence, combined with this deep desire to be entertaining is the foundation of the writing for me. Like I, I do have some education in it and I have this other kind of layman's perspective that's like, I know how I wanna make people feel. So you, a couple things. First is my son, Jack O'Leary. I know uh, Corrigan, you know, the name O'Leary is from Ireland yeah. as well. So Jack O'Leary is an athletic kid. He's my oldest. He's a senior in high school. He's on varsity soccer. And I love that fact. And I'm proud of him. But by far the proudest I've ever been of him uh, in high school is when my wife and I went to go see him in mock trial. And I see this young man wearing a suit that, that doesn't quite fit perfect. I don't think a, totally, a suit fits totally. a high school boy perfect ever. And he's up there on the stand and he's taking, you know, he's pretending like he's given a deposition and it's all kind of make believe while you're using your words and you're arguing against the other side. And I have never been more proud of my son in that kind of world as much as I was that day, far more so than on the athletic field. So I understand what you're saying about the power of words and using them well. You go on, you graduate, you get your master's. And then what do you want to do with that afterwards? What's the career path? I always wanted to be a writer. <clears throat> That's all I ever wanted in every journal. I mean, I've been a journal keeper, keeper since seventh grade. I have them all still. And basically I wanted to like lose 20 pounds, quit smoking and be a writer. That was my worldview. And also maybe like hook Andy Sheehan or Kenny Graves until falling in love with me. Those were my big goals. How are you, and how are you doing, doing on those three goals? I don't smoke anymore. Okay. I got to be a writer. I made out with Kenny Graves once <laughs> and uh, I'm still 20 pounds overweight. Well, congrats on achieving the goals you have already accomplished and, uh, yeah. and living a life that is worthy and meaningful and uh, beneficial to others. Yeah. Uh, writing, man. My wife and I early today went up to my son's high school and had a, had a service up there. And on the way out, they celebrated some of the old alum teachers. Uh, and one of the guys taught me freshman year English, and I am mm. not academically inclined. And one of the most meaningful things for me in my entire life was signing books at a Barnes and Noble. And, you know, yes. you, you look at the guy in front of you and then you sign to her and then you look at the lady and you sign to her and up on and on. But you don't really know the individual. And then Fred stands up next one in line. And I'm like, Fred, Mike, you're, you believed way before me, mm. but I think it would have almost been malpractice if Fred or my other English teachers had said there is a easy path forward for writers. Cause there's not, there is a path, but my gosh, it is up and down and left and right and full of nooks and crannies. So were there any teachers or leaders or parents along the way that said, you know what, Kelly, uh, maybe you should choose a different path? No, but nobody affirmed my path either. I mean, being a writer is so interesting because it's a little bit like being a runner. Like you could put on your sneakers and go run today and tomorrow and the next day. And you could sort of say, I'm a runner. Like anyone can write any day of the week. And in this world, anyone can share it. So if all you want to do is write and share it, that's available to everyone. If you want to build a career around it, if you want to be published by um, Random House, that's a whole different story. But I do think that it's smart to carve out space for people who want to write and not make it a career because I think writing is super valuable to honing your thoughts. Mm. I think that it's a reflective behavior that's probably super good for our central nervous systems to stop and write in a journal every day. 
so everyone should be a writer. Like there's a reason why we make people read books in high school and college and make them write papers. It's a way of thinking better and harder and smarter and with slightly more discipline that I think is, shouldn't people should never stop. If you wrote, if you've ever written, like start writing again. If you want to be like a published writer who gets on the New York Times bestseller list, that's like the biggest crapshoot ever. Um, but no, no one ever, I never felt discouraged. And in, in college, I had a couple things published in the creative writing magazine. So I found that kind of encouraging. Mm. And then after college, I went traveling. I worked for a couple of years at United Way in Baltimore. And then I went traveling for a year with my friend, Tracy Tuttle. And we were nannies in Australia. And the family that I was a nanny for had just lost their mom. This mom died of cancer really young. She had a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. And I was their nanny. And in that family was her, her son from her first marriage, who was more or less my age and real cute. Her father, who had come over when she was dying to live with them and still lived with them. Her second husband, and then these two little kids. And I tried to write that story when I got home. I mean, I, I was writing constantly when I was there. Yeah. But it, it made me think a lot about my mom in a way that I really hadn't before. And then there was just this fluky thing, which was that, they did, that it was not a house of a thousand books. It was a house of 150 books. And one of them was My Antonia by Willa Cather, which is my mom's favorite book. And I had never read it. And of course it had come up. And if you're an English major, you're going to hear about Willa Cather. I still hadn't read it. And I had a lot of downtime. Like I was living in a small house in suburban Sydney, Australia with these two little kids who went to school every day. And so I just sit in that house and get a blanket and read that book. And it, it, it made me newly curious about my mom because it's such a romantic story. It's a, it's a really nostalgic story. This guy loved this girl, Antonia or Antonia, and then he didn't marry her in the end. And he goes back to see her. He goes on a train to go see her. It's the whole story. And I thought, this is what my mom likes. <laughs> like my mom likes this. This is so weird to me. I would think she would like, like an accounting book, you know, or like uh, how to run a family by Harvard business school and the Pope. Like I, I just, the idea that she would escape into a story like that, that's so sentimental was the beginning of really wanting to understand what I didn't yet know about her, which was a lot. When did you begin sharing vulnerably your own story? Because that is a, a leap of faith to put yourself out there. Well, when I got diagnosed at 36, I definitely wrote all the time. And then that was right around, that was 2004, August 9th, 2004. And blogging was sort of a new thing at that moment. And so I had this idea that I should put things on the internet, basically with the, with the concept or the goal that people who had a friend who was diagnosed would read this and then they would have some sense of like what it was like for the person and it would make them feel more comfortable being around that person and engaging with the support of that person. So it was called circusofcancer.org. And it's not there anymore and I don't know where it went and I don't understand where, who served it or anything. I mean, I just, it's like a blur to me. But the idea was here's some story, here's some of my stories about like getting diagnosed, getting a biopsy, um, getting my first chemotherapy, meeting my surgeon, et cetera. So just deep dives on these moments in right. the cancer story. And then here's a list of things people have done for me around each of these moments that I found super helpful. So it's basically like, you just found out someone you love got diagnosed, go here, we'll tell you what it's like and we'll tell you what to do. And so that was really the first time I think I shared super personal writing. There is a guy I interviewed recently named Bruce Feiler, also an author, several best-selling books, including The Council of Dads. And as a young dad, I think his girls at that point were twins, maybe three or four. 
And he, uh, you know, when you get a diagnosis of cancer, it seems like the first thing you would think about is your own mortality, you. And for him, of course, it went to his daughters right away. And so what he did is he built a console of dads on the chance that he passes away. He wanted men in his life to step forward and become the fathers, the surrogate fathers of these girls to love them and to raise them and to guide them forward in life. And it's a beautiful idea, one that, that I think every dad, every mom should assume as a, as a responsibility. When you got this diagnosis and, the, you know, capital C, man, you got cancer and it's real now. How did that change the way you saw parenting and your role as a mom and how finite this relationship with your babies could be? I'm an optimist. And so I was only really afraid for about a month or six weeks. So wow. I was afraid when I got, when I found the lump, I was afraid when I went to have the biopsy, the guy was really negative and could clearly tell that it was, I mean, it was huge. It was seven centimeters by four centimeters. So there's just no way that it was anything but cancer. I was scared when I started chemo. And I think after the second chemo, so I went every other week, it was called dose dense because I'm young and I can handle a lot of like toxic inputs. And after the second one, so that would have been a month into it, my chemo nurse, whose name was Susie Eater, who I loved to this day, was feeling it and said, it's softer. Mm. And so to me, it was like, it's working. Because the, the fear was very specific for me, which is what if I'm a corner case? Like this is a very known disease, even though stage it was stage three for me, most stage three people do okay. And so all I, the only thing that was left to figure out was, am I some weird corner case where this chemo, this adromyosin cytoxin that seems to work for 95% of the people is not gonna work for me. And it immediately, 30 days in, seemed like it was having an impact. And then 45 days in, it was clearly having an impact. And so then I, it shifted for me into, this is very weird. I am very young. I had recently had a melanoma. So I had these two strange occurrences. And I- Unrelated or are, are those related at all or no? Mine, mine were unrelated. All right. So they say, or so they think, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. But the interesting thing to me was, oh, the, the shift in my thinking is I'm probably not going to live to be 80. Like if I've had cancer twice and two different kinds of it, by the time you're 36, like there's something funny about me. There's something receptive about me. And that's actually not a bad point of view to adopt. It's not, it's probably a mistake mm. for anybody in terms of a decision-making environment to assume, ah, I get about 80 years and then I'll start to fall apart and I'll die when I'm 85. You know, like it, maybe, maybe, but maybe not. And maybe it's to your benefit as a person who's in charge of your life to think in shorter increments. Like a big thought I had when I, when I finished all that, all that chemotherapy and surgery and radiation, I said, what is my chance for recurrence? And he said, with your age and the size of your tumor and the aggressiveness, I would say 30%. And I was like, I have a 30% chance of having this again. And he's just in the next five years. If you don't have it in the next five years, you know, you, your chances are probably the same as anybody walking the street today. And I remember thinking, God, if this comes back in five years, not that if it kills me in five years, but if it comes back and like derails my whole life again, what will I have wanted to do in these five years? Mm -hmm. What and were the this answers? crazy thing happened. Like I, I wrote this story about me and my dad. It was called The Middle Place. And it was the story of that one year when we both had cancer. And then every other chapter is like a flashback to childhood. So the whole book in total feels like, what is it to be someone's kid when you're a kid? And what is it to be their kid when you're, quote, all grown up? And that book was you know, life-changing. It was on the bestseller list for six months. It passed Obama's books. I mean, it was sitting right at the top with three cups of tea and, you know, everything changed. I mean, it, from a career point of view, everything changed. All, all sorts of 
doors flew open and really in a way that I would have dreamt of. Like I, this is what I wanted. Like I really wanted this. I had, I had been a reader of Anne Lamott's. I love her. And Anne. me too. And I love her as a person. And I just, I, she, she was a very specific vision for me. Like I just loved her life and I kind of got it. Like I kind of got what I wanted really. So it's, it's you you can't choose that kind of success you can write a beautiful book you can be open and vulnerable about your life and your dad and the upbringing about cancer and the struggle and, and being in the middle but then this thing happens so i a couple questions around that first is why do you think it enjoyed the success it did and still does it's super readable like people read it in a in a day or two which is hilarious because it took me a couple of years to write and they're just whipping through it while the laundry dries. But I think when I look at the bestseller list week to week, I feel like there's always one slot for an unknown person with a, telling a true story that is highly readable. So it's, it's funny. Like the book is funny and people often cry. So it's got sort of all the emotional offerings that a person would want. But my gut is that when a book sells that well, it's selling to people who don't read that many books. And when you're selling to people who read just a handful of books a year, it has to be not a page turner, but I mean, it has to be like highly readable. So it packs a punch, but it moves. Like you are not, it's not a slog at all to read it. And so I, I think that's the truth about that book. My dad is a world-class character and I know how to describe him. Like he, he's totally irresistible and you get it from page one. Like the first line of the middle place is the thing you need to know about me is I'm George Corrigan's daughter. If you haven't met him yet, I highly recommend it. Then there's some sort of tactical things that happen. Like this one really weird thing happened, which is that I had written this essay about women and friendship. It's called Transcending. And it was way, basically, I, and this is news to our listeners. I'm not a woman. I <laughs> loved that article, man. And, uh, it, and it's so powerful. Thanks. <laughs> really, really. So I had well. written this thing and I was watching my mom and her friends who were way down the road from me and my friends. And I was predicting like, this is what a woman's friendship looks like over 50 years. First, you try working out together, then you try diagnosing each other's, you know, head lice or basement odors, and then someone dies and you become closer and you become essential. So anyway, it was sort of this predictive thing. And I, I read it in this woman's backyard and she filmed it and she put it on YouTube and it circulated like crazy. And this was in 2008, maybe. And people emailed it to each other. So there was, it was sort of pre Facebook having video capacity. So it was just this crazy link that was like, I love you guys. And they'd send it to all their best friends. And 5 million people watched it in like two days. And I, because it was so, un, such a, a strange thing, it just wasn't, it was so organic. Like yeah. I had this thing, I wrote this thing, I read it in this lady's backyard. Her brother videotaped it. Like, you know, it was, and, that was a good introduction of me to people because it's mm. really true. It's everything I believe. It had all these fun old pictures of my mom and her friends. And so that, that, that was really impactful. I think. You know, you are an awesome friend and you write about that a lot, but one of your friends, one of your best friends gets cancer and you share that story as well. And you walk with her all the way to the finish line. And even have the opportunity of, of sharing the eulogy at her service. W would you share just any aspect of her life or your journey with her that you'd like today? So her name is Liz Lotz, Liz Ross and Lotz. And she um, is married to my husband's best friend. And she's a, she was a sort of somewhat deferential person. So she's, she was married to Andy who is a big, huge personality. Like Andy could be a Corrigan. Andy could be an O'Leary. Like he's a storyteller. He can hold a room. And 
And she kind of tucked in behind that. Like, I think she liked being his number two. But she's a big thinker. Like, she read three newspapers a day and she was pretty invested in public policy. And so she was very outward focused. She wasn't much of a me person. She didn't need much. And Andy's light is so bright that I think I missed her for a minute. Like, I just didn't, I didn't know what to do with her at first. Then I got sick and, and she was lovely to me. And she's, she's like a person you could trust, you know, she's like loyal and quiet and reliable. And, and that, and, you know, I was so young, I was 36. So for my group of friends, it was a big learning experience for all of us. It was like, wow, this is crazy. What's it like? And then, you know, not long after she got ovarian cancer and because I had been through something vaguely similar, but not that similar in the end, she trusted me a little bit. And that began this very intimate multi-year conversation where I felt that my role was to let her say the harder, more awful things that other people would try to cheer her out of. Mm. So I feel like I was a place where she could say, I don't think this is working. I think I'm going to die. And I want Andy to have another wife. And I, I, I want them to stay in our house, but not forever. And I'm worried about what's going to happen to my parents. And once you establish that I'm not afraid to hear your most horrible thoughts, then you can be invaluable to somebody because it's very, most people find it very uncomfortable to be in the room with mortality. They want to go up a couple levels as fast as possible and like start cleaning your counters and making jokes about like weed that you could smoke so that it wouldn't hurt so much. And that's totally fine. But for some reason we went there and then, and then it was clear to me that that was sort of my role was not to, not to draw that out, but just to be open to it. If, if that's where she wanted to go. And, you know, more and more she wanted to go there because Andy is a believer in positivity and the relationship between positivity and physical healing, Yeah, which is awesome. And probably there's some truth there. But if you're Liz Lotz and you have done it all and you have done 96 rounds of chemotherapy and seven surgeries and, you know, you're 105 pounds and 5'10", like it, the, all the positive thinking in the world is not going to get you out of that. And, you know, the other thing that we really learned is that when it's really happening, when you're in the last 30 days, your husband probably can't see it. They just probably can't let it in. It, mm. it's, it's probably asking too much of a man to, to see what we were seeing. So, you know, like 12 days before she died, Andy said to Edward, you know, there might be a, this was in December. There might be a, a trial she can do in April if it, if it gets passed. And Edward and my husband and I looked at each other like, oh my God. You think she's going to make it to April? Like, I don't know if she's going to make it to the end of the week. Yeah. But, but it, it, of course, like the eyes of love are inaccurate and they're needy and, and they want to see something that maybe isn't there. So yeah, that's Liz. And now her kids are phenomenal. She's got a kid who's a junior in college, a kid who's going to be a freshman in college and a, a little guy who's going to be a junior in high school. And I love well, them so much. And I love being with them. One of my favorite things that you do is you have a part of your work called, thank you for being here. Oh yeah. And uh, I've given several best men speeches and, and uh, of course done a lot of work in the community, given speeches. I've never been invited to give a eulogy. And it, it's sacred space, man. I mean, you, you better be on point or just say, no, thank you. Not this time for your friend, Liz, you, you have the opportunity of standing in front of her family and those little kids before you knew that they were going to be okay. 
because you don't know, certainly not on that day, that the things are going to be okay at some point. And they never are going to be the same. But uh, you were just bragging on how great these kids are now. From your recollection of that day, as you stood in front of them, what, what was the primary core piece of your message? Well, anyone can see it. It's on the internet. Just do Kelly Corrigan, Liz Lots, L-A-A-T-S. Um, the thing that I wanted was to restore a vision of her in her at full strength. So a thing that drove her crazy was that she was actually a very athletic and capable woman. And she was afraid that her kids were going to have this lasting image of her like in her pajamas limping around nauseous unable to eat sipping on a little tea to see if it could settle her going to bed at 6 30 not coming out of her room until 10 30 like that that killed her yeah. that they had such an inaccurate understanding of who she was at full strength and so in the eulogy, like a, a definite agenda for me was to bring that part of her to life. It was also a part of her that I got to enjoy over the years. So the four of us are all snowboarders and, and I'm the least capable of the four of us. And so Andy and Edward would go off into the trees and do this kind of high risk snowboarding. And Liz would ride with me and I just would follow her and she was very beautiful person. Like she was sort of tall and lean. She kind of looked like Linda Evangelista. Like she was a, like a model. She had super high cheekbones and she wore her hair in interesting ways. And, and she had these great shoulders and this great collarbone and, (laughs) and the way she moved, like she just looks so good in a dress. You can't like dresses were made for this girl. And the way she moved on the mountain, I just so admired. And I, I even admired actually the way she moved in a kitchen. Like I remember thinking like, you're so smooth. It's, there's nothing kind of herky jerky in your way. She's, she was very calm across the board, conversationally, emotionally, physically. She had like a kind of relaxed state that I just admired. Cause I'm a little bit more of a spaz. <laughs> Uh, there's so much to say on that. I don't know if I want to play off the idea of you being a spaz and, uh, your <laughs> husband, who I'm personally trying to sanctify for, uh, for his involvement in this thing. Yes. I think I want to go though. You've been through life and death with your family, both your matriarch and patriarch, as well as your children. And you've recently launched them into life. They're, they're both in school. They're both doing their thing and you can write about life today vulnerably. But I, I'm curious, as you look back on the last couple of decades raising these girls, what what was the best thing you did with or for them? Uh, I think we had a lot of humor in our house. And like, we have a line that funny always wins, which means like, if you're begging for something and you can do it in a funny way, you might get it more easily. If you're in the middle of a fight and you can crack a joke, you might be faster to wind down the tension um when you apologize if you can you know put a little funny in it you you probably have the apology accepted sooner so i think it's i think it was a funny house and then we played a lot of games which i like i liked i don't know if they really liked them but i love rummy cube and i love we have this game called king and scum which is kind of like president people play it in college but i brought it into our family life and we had, we spent a lot of hours playing King and Scum. Probably the best thing I gave them is a model of, and I didn't give it to them. It just was dumb luck, but the model of a, a marriage where two people totally have each other's back. Like they know what it looks like. They're not going to be confused when they're out there dating. Like this is, and I, and I felt like I wasn't confused. Like I, I loved the way my parents were married. It was kind of funny and and different. Like she's a real introvert and he's a real extrovert. So, you know, half the time she would say, I'm going to take my own car to the party. You and my go for an hour, you stay. I know you like to stay. And I just thought that, I thought it was crazy when I was young, but I actually think it's really cool now that I'm 25 years into a relationship. 
but you know, like I, we have a very equal marriage. So if, because they're girls, I don't think that I've given them this model where it's like, yeah, I'm the martyr and I do all the cooking and cleaning and I wash every load of laundry. And, you know, we all like show up at the front door when your father walks in with perfume on and our hair done. It's a very unguarded, candid childhood. Right. Like everything was visible to all of them at all times. So I think that will help them pick a good person. Yeah, I do. And I'm, I'm thinking, uh, thank you for being here, you know, where you celebrate toasts that others have given or eulogies others have provided. And as you're talking about your husband, it reminded me of my grandfather and his 50th anniversary to his wife. And something he said was, uh, you know, in 50 years of being married to Caddy, my wife, we've never had a fight. And I think the reason is, he told the audience, I think the reason is, is because on day one of our marriage, I told her how it was going to go, that any big decision, anything of value, anything important, I would make. And anything that was insignificant, you know, not really a big deal. I'd let her decide those things. And he said, it's worked perfectly for the last 50 years because in 50 years, we haven't yet had to make one important decision. You know, so the, <laughs> the humor is Caddy actually wears the pants in that family, which was not exactly true, but the humor still worked. Yeah, what I love yeah. about the way you write about your husband is it's not always butterflies and ponytails. The, the banana bread is not always perfectly placed on the table before breakfast begins. No, one. No, no. Uh, one of the recent fights you had, and eventually it's going to lead into a book, is about, is it enough to say, I'm sorry? Or do you have to say, I was wrong? So one I mean, of you I took think the side of it's it. really going, I think when you're really in something, if you really want to get out of it, you have to agree that you share an opinion about what's right, right and wrong. So if, if we, if something happens and someone transgresses and you don't say I was wrong, then you haven't restored that unified vision of what we as a couple believe is right and wrong. So and I, I just saying, want to salute up. Let me just slow you down for a moment because I want to make sure people hear this. If you're in a marriage partnership, you have a human being who is your friend. If you work somewhere and you're not independently employed, working only for yourself and nobody else, what you're about to hear from Kelly matters. So like this, this is really the way adult humans should be doing life together. So with that as the preamble, Ms. Corrigan, please move forward again. <laughs> So we were having, Ever and I were having this funny discussion about like, what do you need to be able to say to one another to be in a serious adult relationship? And I just started keeping this running list. And one of them, at first somebody said like, oh, you have to be able to say, I'm sorry. And we were like, yes, yes, of course. And then it seemed to me that I'm sorry is one rank below saying I was wrong. And, and Edward to his like endless credit is really good at claiming responsibility and we can be in the middle of it like really pissed at each other and he'll say you're right i was wrong i shouldn't have said that and it it is such a game changer like it's over there's nothing to push back on at that point because what he's saying is i agree with your point of view i agree that that when we talk to each other it should be like this and not like that and i talk to you like that and that is wrong and we are actually in total unity we are it's it's unanimous that this is the way we aspire to be with one another and when we're not we are necessarily definitionally wrong mm. and it, once you start saying it more frequently it's a lot easier to say like it's not that big a deal like did you think you weren't ever going to be wrong like go what? ahead but and say it I, I struggle saying those words so often and you do? I am weak in even saying, I'm sorry. And usually even have a little bit of like a butt behind it. I don't say the word, oh, but because I know that annihilates the, the, the words. Uh, dude, it's just, Hey, my wife listens to these. My mom does as well. So I know, I know they're nodding their head. Finally, this guy's taking some ownership over his, his life. Why is it so difficult to say, you know, dude, I was wrong. I, I, I was wrong. I don't know. It's probably a little different for each person. There's probably some sort of personal backstory where you got flamed for being wrong in some way that like 
put a little block in you, but I know how to get out of it. Like, just say it, say it. it's in the next seven days. Like say it, say it to somebody when it's true. Awesome. Because the first time you say it is twice as hard as the second time you say it. And the fifth time you say it is 20% as hard as the first time you say it. Like you, you can make this easier. It is, it is not, you just have to jump that first time. You just have to dive in and say, I was wrong. 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 Without you even intending to, you've already used three expressions. Uh, tell me more. Yes. I don't know. Yes. And I was wrong. So yes. I'm curious, ignoring those three, give, give me one more that you think is just really important that we adult leaders, listeners, people who love one another need to be able to say clearly in our lives to have healthy adult relationships. Mm. Well, one of them is kind of funny, which is, this is it, which sort of goes back to what we were talking about at the very top, which is like, don't, don't lose the fact that like, it's happening right now. This is, this is the moment you're in. This is the day you're in. This is the people you're in it with. Like, like a life is just a bunch of days days are just a bunch of minutes and a bunch of interactions and like this is it this is this we're real time we're rolling and i think if you can like i actually thought about um having it tattooed on my wrist so that i would see it more like to try to remind myself like another way of thinking about it is today counts yeah like we're a very um ambitious culture and we're always sacrificing now for some future thing. And I have given some graduation speeches in my day. And a thing I always want to say to these kids who have been so future focused for four years, and it's just, everything gets sort of pinned on these acceptance letters that may or may not come, that like today counts too. Like you really don't want the day to come and go, the sun to rise and set without pausing and inserting something meaningful into the schedule, onto the calendar, into the to-do list, into the budget. Like it's a very, um, there are pragmatic ways to make sure that you don't wake up at the end of 10 days and think, I have no idea what I just did for the last 10 days. I don't remember anything. Like there were no salient moments. Well, it's like, well, they're super easy to have. And actually, and I'm sure you feel this way, podcasting forces that on us because you're preparing to talk to someone and because we're giving each other our full attention right now, which is rare. Like Edward and I don't talk for one hour, eyeball to eyeball without (laughs) no one touching their phone. But this kind of work interviewing people, I mean, I always feel it on the PBS set where all of a sudden there's 13 people in the room, the lights, camera, action, and then it's me and Brian Stevenson and I am eyeball to eyeball and I have one hour and nobody looks away. Like I I remember interviewing James Corden and thinking like, I I almost feel like I'm falling in love because (laughs) I'm staring at your blue eyes and we are completely focused on each other. And it was, by comparison, showing me how yeah. distracted most of my interactions are. So we're lucky and smart to do this kind of work, both of us, because it puts you in your body again. It yeah. like it like lines things up again where your values and your choices and behaviors are all sitting together in the same place for a minute. You know, because you value connection and purpose and I value connection and purpose. And this job that we both do makes us live there. When you, what made all of what you said, there just come to life is when you said we're, you know, we're rolling. And when I think about like the videos I do pre-recorded, if I'm not live, I'll start like 11 different times before I actually say the right thing the right way. But when we're live, like we're rolling, um, 
we get it right the first time. And I think there's yeah. something about being live in the moment that changes the moment itself. And then I'm thinking about you and James hanging out and how you're trying to date the guy now. And I think the reason why you're falling in love with him and why you fall in love with your work is not only do you feel more alive in doing it, it probably reminds you of the, one of the most alive guys you've met named dad. Yeah. And so the way he treated everybody is the way you treat those that are in front of you when you're doing this work and when you're doing your life totally. the right way. So Kelly Corgan, as we do this work together, unfortunately, it's going to have to come to its appropriate conclusion relatively soon. We we have seven questions that tether all of our guests together. Great. So this is a gauntlet that about 600 of your friends have uh, somehow made their way through in the past. First one's probably going to be hard for you because you've read so much, but what's been the most inspirational or impactful book you've ever read? Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. Why? Have you heard of it? I have, but it's I've never read it. It's astonishing. It's a, it's an old pastor 150 years ago in the Midwest who's dying and he has a young son, an eight-year-old son, and he's afraid the son won't remember him. And he's just telling the story of his life and his faith and his wanderings and wavering on paper for this kid to read when he gets older. And it's mm. Marilyn Robinson won the Pulitzer for it. She's like a Nobel prize winning type woman, incredible mm. thinker. And um, it's called Gilead. And I, I've given away 30 copies and I'd give away 30 more. I mean, it's just- You just sold one a moment your ago. your heartbeat. Yeah. Everybody stop what you're doing, put down what you're reading. What's one positive characteristic you possessed as a little girl growing up outside of Philadelphia that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? I was a diver. I don't think I could do the things I once did off a diving board. So maybe that was just a little more physically daring than I am now. I'm a little, a little careful. If your home caught fire. And your husband and the girls and any animals you may have are out safely. And you have an opportunity of running in and grabbing one item. What's that one physical thing you'd return with? I mean, I have a Wawa, an orange Wawa crate of journals. Uh, so I might go grab that. I read books on paper and I write in books. I mean, I write in every book I read. I do too. And underline and highlight things and... So it's sort of like the story of my intellectual life is there, but I don't know that anyone needs that. Everyone should discover their own. Maybe the journals. I might grab the journals. If you could sit on a gorgeous day on a bench and have a long conversation with anyone living or deceased, who do you want right next to you? I mean, I really would want my daughters. You can't always get a long, gorgeous conversation with them. Like they're a little, they're slippery. They're hard to catch. So if I could sit and talk to somebody for a couple hours and I could talk to the two of them, that would be pretty heavenly. But if you're looking for a bigger name, I mean, I wouldn't mind talking to Marilyn Robinson. I wouldn't mind sitting there with a copy of Gilead and saying, what about this? Tell me more about this. I have a total girl crush on Michelle Obama. I don't know who doesn't have a girl crush on Michelle Obama. But I've heard her talk a lot, so I, I maybe maybe it wouldn't be that surprising. Meryl Streep, Jodie Foster, like some really well, it's a bit, it's a crowded person. bench. I know, I know. I want them all. Give them to me. What's the best advice any of those ladies, your daughters, Liz, your dad, or anybody else has ever offered to you? So the best advice you've ever received is? Oh, for God's sake, Kelly, who's looking at you? Who said it? My mom, <laughs> but it's fantastic. It's like, there's 8 billion people here and people are mostly thinking about themselves. So don't worry about it so much. Like do what you want to do, make what you want to make, put some stuff out there. It doesn't matter the, nobody's looking at you. Like you're you don't matter that much. I, I think that's a really important thing to, to know. You just, you're not that important. What advice would you give yourself at age 20? So if you, you could go back in time, just a couple of years and whisper some wisdom your way, junior year in college, what would you say? Don't worry, it's coming. Kelly Corgan, it has been said that all great people and authors and podcast hosts and PBS stars and moms can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? She left it all on the field. 
for a self-proclaimed non-athlete. I wasn't expecting that as the answer, but I love it. Kelly Corgan yeah. indeed left it all on the field and uh, she took us along for the ride and reminded us not only what matters most, but also what matters far less importantly. I, I just thank you for your work around relationships, struggles, and life. Thanks. Thanks for uh, yours. My friends, that is Kelly Corrigan. My name is John O'Leary, and today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. Well, my friends, there were so many powerful aspects of the conversation today with Kelly. I loved her respect and her love of her father. I know my dad is listening to my voice right now. So, Dad, I feel the same way about you, my friend. I love how she observed and celebrated her mother, not only while she was a young girl and a young woman, but even after the loss of her dad, she acknowledged that her mother remained this brave, courageous, tenacious woman, even as she entered into widowhood. The importance of saying, I'm wrong, as well as I'm sorry. They don't live separately. They live together. Not only saying, I'm sorry, shucks, but also owning the fact that I was wrong. And then the idea, and this one's really a big deal, of thinking about small increments in our life. That showed up, I think, most clearly during her recovery from cancer. She was learning about the chances that the cancer might come back. That's when she asked herself what she wanted to accomplish, not at the end of her life, but over the next couple of years within her life. Small steps. It was then that she decided to write a book about the sliver of time when parenthood and childhood overlap. This book, it's called The Middle Place, it's a powerful book, became her first New York Times best-selling book. Brothers and sisters, family and friends, so often in life we focus on the big end goal. What's that big grandiose thing we're going to do in retirement? But imagine the possibilities when we can think instead of life in these smaller, more beautiful, more manageable increments. That's when we can take mighty steps forward inch by inch to change our world and the world. My friends, if you enjoy today's conversation as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you, I have a feeling that you will love the conversation we shared several years back with Brene Brown. Brene is a six-time New York Times bestselling author. She's an expert in studying courage and vulnerability and shame and empathy. You can listen in to Brene's conversation that we had together on the Live Inspired podcast at episode 103. You can go directly to our website for the podcast, which is johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. And we'll have her, of course, under episode 103. Or you can take a deeper dive into the conversation on vulnerability and shame and possibility and life by joining me in our members-only community right now. This is where we hang out and continue the conversation. There is space here for you, so I'm going to tell you right now where to visit me. It's at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash together. If you're looking to learn more about other examples of stories that involve hope and inspiration and redemption and impact, or you're long, longing to write one in your own life, well, cruise on over with me. Let's do life together at John O'Leary Inspires dot com forward slash together i'm looking forward to seeing you there so my friends for this time and until next time this is john o'leary and today is your day what a gift live inspired